In physics classes at school, it is often said that an electromagnetic field is a special type of matter surrounding electric charges. This formulation is present in many school textbooks and various encyclopedias, but I dare to strongly disagree with it, especially since its usage gives listeners an incorrect understanding of what is happening. Indeed, upon hearing the phrase about a field as a special type of matter, one is inclined to ask what this special type of matter consists of. You won't get an answer to this question. And this leads to the widespread assertion that physicists themselves don't know what an electric field is. In other videos on our channel, I have indirectly touched on this question several times, but perhaps it's time to dedicate a separate video to it and clearly and unambiguously answer the question of what an electromagnetic field is and what it actually consists of. But first, let's talk about what a field is in general. Without delving into mathematical subtleties, any field is a kind of map of the distribution of some quantity's values in space. For example, the air near the Earth's surface has different temperatures at various points around the globe, and we can draw a temperature field indicating its value at each point. We can also define a field of the heights of the Earth's surface above sea level. This field we call a physical map of the world. Thus, all fields are associated with certain physical quantities, but they themselves are not physical objects. If we were to ask what these fields consist of, it would turn out that they consist of numbers, meaning they are mathematical abstractions. In our example, with the air temperature field, this field, of course, has physical significance. It allows us to determine where it is hot and where it is cold. But it is hot or cold there, not because the temperature field is such. The temperature differences have their own physical causes, and the field is merely a way to show the result of these causes combination. In fact, it is not necessary for a field to have any specific physical meaning. We can construct a field of any quantity, even a field of potato prices. I hope no one will question what such a field consists of or feel the need to call the field of potato prices a special type of matter. Earlier, we talked about fields consisting of numbers. In physics, such fields are called scalar fields. However, in addition to scalar quantities, such as mass, temperature, and the like, physics also deals with vector quantities, such as force or velocity. Therefore, fields of physical quantities can be not only scalar, but also vector. A classic example of a vector field is the velocity field of a fluid or gas flow. We can determine the magnitude and direction of the flow's velocity vector at any point and construct the corresponding field. The appearance of this field will, of course, be determined by the physics of the processes affecting the fluid or gas flow. Moreover, by studying only the appearance of this field, we can learn a lot about the physics of the processes occurring in the system. Entire branches of physics are largely devoted to reconstructing physical processes based on the appearance of vector fields and vice versa. And sometimes these fields indeed begin to seem material, but they remain just as much mathematical abstractions as the scalar field of potato prices. Once again, the fluid flow is a physical object and a form of matter consisting of molecules. But the vector field describing this flow is non-material and is a mathematical abstraction consisting of mathematical objects, vectors. Water can be poured into a glass, weighed, smelled, or tasted. You can't do that with a field. It exists only in our minds or on a sheet of paper or a computer screen. What about the electric field? It is also a distribution in space of a certain physical quantity, the electric field vector, which indicates what force will act on an electric charge placed at a given point in space. So, what does an electric field consist of? Correct, it consists of vectors, being a mathematical abstraction. Is there any real physical content behind this abstraction? Of course there is. The attraction or repulsion of charged objects is a quite real physical process. But does this fact imply that the electric field itself is a material object? Certainly not. So why is it called a special form of matter? The reason lies in the history of physics. Specifically, the events of the times when people were just beginning to understand how electromagnetic interaction works. We know that two bodies with electric charge, placed at a certain distance from each other, will exert a certain force on each other. But the question is, how does one charged body know that another is located at some distance from it? In classical mechanics, 
forces usually arise from the direct interaction of bodies. We hit a ball and it flies away. Interaction occurs through physical contact, and this seems to be the only possible way. Manipulating an object without direct contact always looks mysterious and strange. This phenomenon is called telekinesis, and since ancient times, telekinesis has been a favorite way to claim possession of supernatural powers. In most cases, however, it turned out that there was no magic, and the manipulator and the object were simply connected by invisible threads or something similar. But here we have two charged bodies that definitely exert forces on each other at a distance, demonstrating real telekinesis. So either telekinesis had to be acknowledged as a real phenomenon, or it had to be assumed that charged bodies were indeed connected by some invisible threads that we, for some reason, couldn't yet detect. Scientists of the 17th and 19th centuries took the second path, assuming that the interaction of charged bodies was carried out through the ether, a gas made of tiny elastic particles. In this concept, the interaction of charged bodies was no more an action at a distance than blowing out a candle by affecting it with a stream of air. For 300 years, the best minds of their time tried to develop a theory of etheric electromagnetism, but none of them succeeded in achieving satisfactory results. And a series of experiments in the early 20th century revealed facts that directly contradicted the ether theory. Under the pressure of these facts, the ether had to be abandoned. And as a result, science found itself in a rather difficult position. If there was no ether, then how on earth did charged particles interact at a distance? The way out of this predicament was found as follows. Since there seemed to be no ether, but some intermediary for the transmission of electromagnetic interaction was needed, let's simply say that this intermediary is the electric field itself. In other words, what was recently a mathematical abstraction was decided to be recognized as a material object, a special form of matter. Why special? Well, because in the usual sense, a field is immaterial. You can't touch it, pour it into a glass, cut a piece off it, and so on. Why matter? Because the intermediary in the transmission of interaction must be material. What exactly does this special form of matter consist of? Who knows, said physicists, maybe we'll figure it out later. In this sense, the electric field as a special form of matter became a support, holding up the already quite grand building of electrodynamics from a complete collapse, until physicists figured out what was really going on. Fortunately, the wait wasn't long, and by the 1930s and 1940s, quantum electrodynamics emerged as a particular case of quantum field theory, which finally explained how charged particles interact with each other. We have a separate large video on how this interaction occurs, so I won't go into detail here. I will just remind you that in quantum electrodynamics, electromagnetic interaction is explained by the fact that charged objects have the property of emitting and absorbing special particles, the quanta of electromagnetic interaction known as photons. These particles have no mass, but do have momentum. So by emitting and absorbing such particles, Charged objects change their own momentum and start moving, as if some force were acting on them. The characteristic known as electric charge turned out to be a measure of an object's ability to emit and absorb photons, and the electric field intensity was a measure of the probability of finding a photon with certain characteristics at a given point in space. And everything fell into place. Electromagnetism received a consistent explanation as the direct interaction of material objects, charged bodies, the photons they emit, or, if we dig deeper, such an unusual object as the physical vacuum. It is the vacuum that, in modern physics, can probably be called a special form of matter with quite non-trivial properties. And the electric field, as any field should, return to being a mathematical abstraction, a way of representing, describing, and analyzing physical processes. The need for the support of electrodynamics in the form of the electric field as a special form of matter disappeared. But nevertheless, this support, either out of habit or simply out of inattention, remained, and it still wanders through textbooks and reference books, misleading those who are earnestly trying to study physics. And this is certainly deeply regrettable. I hope my dear viewers will no longer stumble over this support in their journeys through the beautiful and fascinating world of physics. 
a journey we will certainly continue in our next videos. Well, that's all for now. Goodbye and see you next time.